Hello, I'm going to be discussing Afra Ben and her text, Orinoco. These are some general themes and uh, wrap up questions, things for us to consider after completing reading the text. Although this may seem something that might be relegated to scholars, um, people that study literary history in theory, I think it's very important for us to recognize Afroben's place in history as an English woman and <clears throat> as a writer. Uh, I think that her position in the content, the substance of Orinoco, uh, in many ways is precarious. She has to do things very carefully because she would be under uh, a greater critical eye by her audience. And the fact that she's producing uh, what many scholars say is the first modern novel. Uh, in an earlier presentation, I discussed some other potential candidates for the first novel, but I think Afra Ben uh, is right there. And so I think that this is very important. Um, to consider the place of Orinoco as one of the first novels or as a pre-novel form. So why is this important? Because this form today, the novel, uh, I would argue is the dominant literary form. And it's important to recognize then that the first modern type of novel was written by a woman, which is then uh, the novel then becoming the major dominant literary form uh, <clears throat> in the last 200 years. So the introductory literary to the text, what does this accomplish? Um, this is a fairly standard convention that we might see in the 17th and 18th century. Uh, when we come across it in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, we're going to um, uh, find that the entirety of the novel is written in epistolary form, in letter form. But what does this mean uh, that Orinoco begins with a letter? I think it does a couple of things. One is, is I think it creates a sense of intimacy. I mean, when we think about letters today, we're thinking about, you know, uh, a text message or an email letter per se. But think about what happens when you get like um, a card for your birthday that's handwritten. Now that seems very different than the other forms of letter writing that you might receive. It's more intimate. And I think in this way, it functions similarly, that the letter at the beginning of the text creates a kind of intimacy between the author and you as the reader. It also allows, the second thing that I would suggest is that there's this kind of porousness about the story being real or fictional. And, and, and let's think about it in terms of our own modern uh, moment here. You know, a movie that is, you know, made or torn from the headlines, right? I mean, this is uh, uh, the stuff of TV shows. Uh, real life story made into a movie. These are things that catch our eye that for, uh, for many of us, we might pay a little bit more attention to. So the sorts of things that are discussed, the plot, the way it unfolds with Orinoco and the other cast of characters, the author is trying to get our attention and not relegate this completely to fiction, but saying that there is some truth in this. And this, I think, makes it more powerful. The third thing that I think this letter does is it situates Afra Ben as the author as the narrator in this text and Ben is able to discuss the precariousness, the difficulty of being a writer. Uh, in my version on page 194, which is the Norton Anthology of World Literature, volume two, the shorter fourth edition, in this first paragraph, the author states, this is a true story of a man gallant enough to merit your protection. So this speaks to my second point about how this is a real life story, which would garner perhaps a lot more interest. At the bottom of this, uh, of this letter, the author writes, though it may serve to excuse some of its faults and connection, for I never rested my pen a moment for thought, tis purely the merit of my slave that must render it worthy of the honor it begs. What is uh, Ben saying here? What is the author saying? What is the narrator in this text here saying that there may be some 
mistakes. There may be some errors. The author is saying that this is not a perfect text. It takes a lot of work, and she has put in the effort to write as close and as truthful an account as possible. So we have the question of the narration and the narrator. I mean, this story is told through the narrator's point of view. Um, and so the question that we have to ask is maybe whose story is this? This is a story about Orinoco, but this is the story about Orinoco told through the narrator's perception. So those are two different things for us to consider. Finally, the relationship between the first part of the novel and the second. The first part, uh, as I discussed in an earlier lecture, the first part of this novel, I think, has very much a fairy tale quality. It feels medieval, uh, like um, Marie de France's uh, lays or whatnot. It's about courtship and betrayal and court intrigue. And we see the love between Orinoco and Imoinda, and I think we can identify with that love. And then we can also feel the tragedy when the king takes Imoinda for himself, and this then will facilitate the betrayal and the anger, uh, and this will move us to the second, uh, second part of the novel. The second part of this novel, I think in many ways, feels more modern, uh, more realistic. Uh, certainly the violence that is explicated uh, is over the top. It is overwhelming. Uh, in many ways, it is postmodern. It is hyperviolent. So there is a, definitely a divide, not only in terms of plot, in terms of geography. The first part, uh, plot, excuse me, the first part of the novel takes place in Africa. The second part of the novel takes place in the colony of Suriname, which is in the north of South America. So not just in terms of geography, but in terms of how it feels, the content of things. In many ways, the second part of this text gets more real. And in a way, we can divide this into the old world and new world. And we put these in quotation marks because this is um, uh, the old world being Europe and the new world being uh, the Americas, but these are only Eurocentric identifications. Okay, a variety of different uh, general themes, general topics. These are different areas that you can do further inquiry into, uh, perhaps to develop an argument, to develop a thesis. And I believe at the end of this presentation, I do have an example of an argument that can be made with an introductory paragraph. These are not exclusive of one another, meaning that one particular category can be a subset of another category. If things were rearranged in the service of some sort of argument, that you might be working on. This is also not an exhaustive list. This, is, this does not contain all of the possibilities. That would be, I would suggest, impossible to do. These are just sort of a general overlook to sort of wrap up and recognize some of the general themes and topics of this text. Okay, so the first one that I have here is ethnography. What is ethnography? Ethnography essentially is the study of other cultures. Um, this is the 17th century. Uh, there's no internet. There's no videos. There's no YouTube uh, videos going on. There's no uh, Facebook posts. There's no my story posts, um, you know, updating your story and things like that. How do people get information? Sometimes it, it, it might take months for people in England or in Europe to read about, let's say, what's going on in the Americas. Another way that people got information was through literature. And I think, Ben, um, there's a, a lot of information about native cultures in this text. And let me give us an example. On the bottom of page 195, about six lines from the bottom, the beads they weave into aprons about a quarter of an L long and of the same breadth working them very prettily in flowers of several colors of beads, which apron they wear just before them, as Adam and Eve did the figure, the, excuse me, the fig leaves. The men wearing a long stripe of linen, which they deal with us for, they thread these beads along on long cotton threads, 
so on and so forth. Um, setting aside the allusion to Adam and Eve for a moment as we're talking about ethnography, there are all sorts of passages throughout this text that describe native culture. So this would fall under the category of ethnography. If you were a reader in late 17th or early 18th century Europe, you are being introduced to various native cultures through Afrobent's text. The second point I want to make here is reason versus emotion. Now, in subsequent lectures, we're going to talk about romanticism, but this is, you know, this is the period of of, of order, of critical thinking, and those sorts of things. And um, you know, this is about civilization and law and governing one's emotions to think clearly. This, in a way, I think, predicts romanticism because all throughout this text, uh, particularly men lose their cool, so to speak, and let their emotions uh, rule their actions. On page 203, here's an example uh, of that. And uh, this is in the service of love, and whether it's love or agony or grief, and then the subsequent action or result of uh, being upset about love or, or being in anguish or grief often turns to other emotions like violence, like going to war. But let me just give you an example on page 203. Um, I am one, two, three, four paragraphs down. While Orinoco felt all the agonies of love and suffered under a torment the most painful in the world, the old king was not exempted from his share of affliction. He was troubled for having been forced by an irresistible passion. Okay, so I think this passage does actually a couple of things. Um, importantly, it aligns the king who takes Imawinda from Orinoco it aligns the king uh, in similar strokes with Orinoco, that there's a similarity between Orinoco and the king. There's a similarity between Orinoco and the king and men in general, these two people being men, that men often are ruled by passion. Uh, oftentimes it is sexual desire, and it makes them think or do things that sometimes are not very uh, clear-headed. I think the story is um, is a love story. You know, the primary sort of engine of this plot is there's a beautiful love story between Imawinda and Orinoco, and there are all sorts of passages. And I think these are some, you know, really beautiful passages all throughout this text that speak to their love. I also think there's a sub uh, a subtext here, a subplot between Aboan and Anahal. And their love is not... Um, their love is not a courtly love. It is one of, um, of usefulness, of function, uh, particularly for Anahal, who is an older woman and has been set aside uh, because of her age and beauty in the king's harem. So she's an older woman. Aren't older women entitled to love? Aren't older women entitled to act on their desires? Um, we don't really see what happens to Abowin and Anahal because they're left behind in the second part of the novel. But while Imawinda and Orinoco are, you know, this great, beautiful and tragic love that ends in, in mutilation and death as a kind of ideal love, uh, the kind of love that we might encounter in, you know, the great tragedies, you know, the beginning of the 17th century, let's say in Romeo and Juliet. But Abowin and Anahal Maybe you're a little bit more realistic. Yeah, you know what? I don't love you so much. Well, I kind of love you. Well, I guess you're okay. Well, we can sleep together. Maybe we'll be together. We'll do the best that we can. And that maybe is a more realistic uh, liming or painting uh, of love in this text. Okay, this is a text that uh, is a critique of colonialism. Uh, you know, people from uh, Europe uh, going into the Caribbean, going into South America, into the Americas, uh, displacing native peoples and setting up their own colonies. And we spoke about that in an earlier presentation. This is a critique and an explication about slavery as a system of labor, uh, how it affects and influences economics, uh, 
it's dehumanization, violence, all sorts of different things this text explains and opens itself up for you, for us, to understand slavery in various different ways. Opens it up, uh, the text is opened up by us for interpretation, um, you know, in thinking about slavery as an institution. And as I think uh, its relationship to Christianity. Uh, I'm on page 217. And all throughout the 17th and 18th and 19th centuries, uh, there was a hot debate, a heated debate between thinkers uh, on, on, on both sides of the argument uh, of slavery. Um, you know, is it, uh, is it something that can be sustained on moral grounds? Is it something that can be sustained on theological grounds? Well, if we take away slavery, what's it going to do to the economic system that we've set up where uh, primarily white uh, plantation owners uh, need an influx of labor? What's going to happen? Is the system, is the entirety of the system going to collapse without slavery? So there's an, there's arguments back and forth, and this is uh, this doesn't really get resolved until, um, and it's really in its totality into the later part of the 19th century. But I think the relationship, the sort of moral question, moral debate, on one hand, how can uh, people treat another human being as property? Uh, how can they be beaten and persecuted and oppressed and in some cases killed without any sort of consequence against the morality uh, and theology is taught uh, in Christian doctrine? And so this was a discussion that was ongoing. And I think in many ways that discussion is present in this text and Christianity is critiqued. And let me just give us an example. On the bottom of page 217, at the bottom of the page, I ought to tell you that the Christians never buy any slaves, but they give, give them some name of their own, their native ones being like very barbarous and hard to pronounce, so on and so forth. Okay, so this is a moment where Orinoco uh, is brought to Suriname and uh, he's renamed. So this has to do with uh, other things, uh, identity and, and whatnot. But that the text says that Christians never buy slaves. Um, yeah, let's not get into semantics here. Let's be real. Um, Christians bought slaves all the time. And this was part of uh, Ben's social critique uh, against European culture, uh, against countries that uh, were engaged. I mean, for Britain, slavery was the most profitable business. Uh, aside from, you know, sugar or silver or whatever the, uh, whatever else they might be into, slavery was the most profitable business. And if you got rid of slavery, uh, bad things to the economy, to the European economy, to the British economy would happen. So this is paradoxical. This is, I think, uh, sarcastic. Um, that very much so uh, is the case that Christians bought slaves. And in fact, and we see in slave autobiography, American slave autobiography in the 19th century, um, and I'm thinking of the, the uh, autobiography of Frederick Douglass, uh, in that he wrote that Christian slave masters were the most violent and most oppressive of the slave masters that he had heard of or that he himself had encountered because they had believed in some way that their powerful position was mandated by God and that they could do whatever they want to their slaves. So it was very uh, dangerous in that way. Sort of following along with uh, ethnography in some way, but Suriname is uh, presented as a paradise. I mentioned uh, a short time ago in one of the passages that I read that uh, the uh, description of the environment, uh, there was an allusion to Adam and Eve. And so uh, Adam and Eve being an important, uh, an important illusion, where was, you know, where was Adam and Eve located in the Garden of Eden? And Suriname is constructed in this text as a Garden of Eden. And what, the, what does this do? Well, if Suriname is constructed as a Garden of Eden and colonialists and 
Europeans come in and destroy that, uh, destroy that Garden of Eden because of resource extraction and commodification, uh, objectification and, and, and enslavement. What does that say about European culture? If European culture, if the sort of center of Christian theology is how to get back to the Garden of Eden that uh, Adam and Eve were exiled, what does it say if you have a space, if you have a place that is like a Garden of Eden, and instead of embracing it, you destroy it? On the top of page 224, just to give you an example here, whose flowery and fruit-bearing branches meet at the top, and hindered the sun, whose rays are very fierce there. From entering a beam into the grove and the cool air that came from the river made it not only fit to entertain people in at all the hottest hours of the day, but refreshed the sweet blossoms and made it always sweet and charming. And sure, the whole globe of the world cannot show so delightful a place as this grove was a grove being a kind of wooded oasis. Here, I'm suggesting this has to do with the Garden of Eden. And European colonialists, imperialists, came into this Garden of Eden and transgressed once again. History sort of repeating itself. Okay, family dynamics, all sorts of interesting things, I think, going on in this text because uh, the king is related in some way to Orinoco and he has coveted Orinoco's, uh, Orinoco's wife. So something for us to consider, the relationships between fathers and sons, uh, in this case, uncles and, and um, uh, nephews and things like that, always something for us to pay attention to. And uh, to consider sex, how it operates uh, in this text. Uh, sex is the medium with which uh, people either express violent passions or express their romantic passions. And I think the line between the two is very precarious. What else? The environment, uh, all sorts of descriptions of the native flora and fauna, but also how the uh, recognizing the beauty of the flora and fauna become commodified or domesticated. There's a, a particular moment in the text where, uh, in Suriname, where there's a river that is very beautiful. And when uh, it was discovered, uh, when gold was discovered, instead of then, instead of the Europeans concentrating on, let's even say the river as a method, of, uh, a way to travel, but the entire river was blocked off from the natives because that was gonna become the space of commodity extraction. So in many ways, <clears throat> whether we're talking about tigers and I think really jaguars or panthers that are being hunted and killed uh, or about extracting gold, uh, I think there's an environmental argument in this text that European culture is about uh, resources and commodification at the expense of the environment. Um, I think there's, uh, there's an argument here to be made uh, pertaining, uh, pertaining to fate. Um, you know, the, that Orinoco in the beginning of this text, it was, uh, I think there are overtures of uh, Greek mythology to this text, which suggests that uh, Orinoco is fated to die. And I think there are signs of this uh, very early on. And much like some of the Greek stories uh, from the first millennium BCE, uh, you know, whether we're thinking about Odysseus or Hector or Achilles, um, particularly with war, I'm thinking uh, particularly of the Iliad and this desire for honor and glory, which is often at the expense of, of other things and maybe even uh, clear thinking. And then finally here, construction of masculinity and femininity. What does it mean to be a woman? What does it mean to be a man? Uh, and I think this text uh, moves into thinking about that. I just want to bring uh, our attention to uh, how this text uh, sort of constructs what it means to be a woman. And in this way, I think that this text is very modern. Uh, I mentioned earlier, what happens to Anahal? Uh, she was part of the king's harem. She is no longer a lover of the king. Why is that? Because she's old. 
So we have beauty attached to the value of a woman here in this text. I think it's important that the writer here is a woman because we may not get this, uh, I think, in this way if the writer was male. Um, and this is, I think, a very, you know, these are things that our culture st uh, struggles with today. We are very much interested, unfortunately, uh, in evaluating and judging both men and women on how they look, on beauty. And there's been lots of, uh, of course, studies, uh, whether we're talking about studies about catcalling and and uh, uh, sexual object, uh, objectification or how uh, a man or a woman with their perceived beauty can be more successful or move up, uh, you know, in a company faster or whatnot. Well, this is not, you know, this is the 21st century. This is the 20th century. This is going on in the 17th century. This is going on 3,000 years ago. Um, so I think in this way, this makes the text, I think, really modern. And let me just bring our attention to one particular passage on page 205. This Anahal, as I said, was one of the cast mistresses of the old king. And twas these now past their beauty that were made guardians or governance to the new and the young ones, and whose business it was to teach them all those wanton arts of love with which they prevailed and charmed heretofore in their turn. I love that word, heretofore. And who now treated the triumphant happy ones with all the severity as to liberty and freedom that was possible in revenge of those honors they robbed them of. So what does this mean here? Well, it means, again, that the value of a woman is based upon her youth and her beauty. And when Anna Hall has become older, she has been cast aside. Well, this suggests, then, that... Uh, Anna Hall is, is less than a woman, less than a person. It presupposes that Anna Hall, and she was younger, you know, was engaging in sexual relations with the king or men of power, that, you know, does Anna Hall, as an older woman, does she still have, uh, or does she have any sexual desire of her own? And I think this is where the sort of subtext or subplot of the love between her and Abba and uh, come in. What is Anna Hall's reaction to being cast aside? She's angry and she takes her revenge on the young women who have become the new uh, concubines, the, the new wives of the king. So Anna Hall, in a position of power over the young women, uses that power in uh, a kind of destructive way and, and in a way this parallels and mirrors the power displayed by the king. So this text in both, uh, in, in both Christian theological ways and I think in humanistic ways uh, tries to define and question what morality is. Uh, what, what is the right thing to do? What is the right way to ask uh, or to act? Uh, and this is between Orinoco and the slaves and the colonialists, the king, questions about monogamy, um, lying, and decency. Um, Orinoco is from Africa where monogamy would have been accepted. I mean, obviously the king has multiple wives, but Orinoco is only interested in, in Mwinda. There's this discussion about the governor of Suriname uh, and about lying. And uh, the, 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 the natives don't the natives of Suriname don't know what lying is until it's explained to them. Then they understand what lying is and say, oh, the governor, you're a liar. So what does this say about European culture? That they are explaining what lying is and they are liars and that this quote unquote primitive culture, this one that is more like, uh, you know, closer to Adam and Eve, if you will, um, they don't know what lying is. They are more moral. So uh, this text is a discussion of the morality of the various cultures. And again, what does this text say about Europeans and, and white culture? Violence and trauma. Why? How? How does it continue? How can it be contained? What is the role of the past? How is trauma uh, expressed? All of these questions, I think violence and trauma go hand in hand. 
Um, it's the person experiencing the violence, the, the audience or spectator that sees the violent act. These are both part of primary trauma or primary violence. And then we have the retelling of this story, secondary trauma. Perhaps we as the audience are, are part of the secondary trauma because the narrator is telling us this story about what happens to Imawinda and Orinoco. How can violence be contained? And this is the difficulty with, um, with violence. I mean, this, this text, I think, we can engage in a conversation, a psychological, uh, a conversation about the psychology of trauma and how it needs to be worked out. And if it's not worked out, then it can become haunting and recurrent. Or if it's repressed, then there are uh, symptomatic manifestations, whether we're talking about uh, obsessive compulsive tendencies or anxiety, uh, nightmares, things that are both conscious and unconscious. And this text uh, engages in a conversation about the theories of violence. One of the uh, theories about violence is that once violence starts, it cannot be contained. And, and, and let's put this in a, in, a, in a kind of modern example. Obviously, in 1945, the United States dropped two atomic bombs on Japan, and this led to the ending of World War II. Today, nuclear missiles, nuclear bombs are much more powerful than they were in World War II. If a country launches a nuclear attack, and you've heard this, I mean, I mean, it's, it's in the literature, uh, we see it in movies, what happens that the one missile, the one nuclear missile becomes the first missile in a whole series of missiles and bombs, and that leads to the destruction of the world. Once the box is open, you can't put it all back in, it all comes out. That once violence begins, it can become overwhelming, it can become uncontained. And I think that we see that here in this text. Once the violence begins in the second part of this text, you know, whether it's in the, the whipping and the, and, and the smaller incidences of violence that the slave experiences on an everyday basis, this leads to the overwhelming violence at the end of this text where Orinoco mutilates the love of his life in Mawinda. And I think it's worthwhile for us to look at this passage on page 237, second paragraph. All that love could say in such cases being ended and all the intermittent irre uh, irresolutions being adjusted the lovely, young, and adored victim lays herself down before the sacrificer. And this has, I think, a biblical overtone. While he, this is Orinoco, with a hand resolved and a heart breaking within, gave the final stroke, first cutting the throat and then severing her yet smiling face from that delicate body. I mean, he's, he's tearing her apart. He just doesn't kill her. He, he's mutilating her. Pregnant as it was with the fruits of tenderest love. So Orinoco has slit the throat and has really begun ripping apart Imawinda, who's carrying his child. About uh, six lines uh, or so down, <clears throat> he turned the fatal knife that did the deed toward his own heart with a resolution to go immediately after her, but dire revenge, which now was a thousand times more fierce in his soul than before, prevents him, and he would cry out, No, since I have sacrificed Imawinda to my revenge, shall I lose that glory which I have purchased so dear. Again, the word, uh, interestingly, I think, glory here. So his the tragic feelings, or the feelings that he has over this horrific deed that he has done, he was planning on killing himself, but he has decided to utilize um his grief, and it changes into feelings of revenge. So he's not going to kill himself, but later he's going to be uh, captured. And it says at the bottom of that passage, and however bent he was on the intended slaughter, he had not power to stir from the sight of this dear object, now more beloved and more adored than ever. And I think it's an interesting point for you to consider why does he now consider Imawinda 
an object. I think there's a, a couple, uh, at least a couple of different ways of considering this. Has Imawinda become an object because she's no longer alive? That she has been, uh, since she has been killed and, and maybe partially mutilated, that she no longer maintains her identity as Imawinda and now she has become a thing. Has Orinoco engaged in the way that other men in this text have commodified women? And if Orinoco has commodified Imawinda, now she is a thing in that way. Or is this a kind of defense mechanism? Because of the horrific deed that Orinoco just engaged in, could he only continue to make sense of the world by blocking out the act and no longer thinking about Imawinda as Imawinda, but rather a thing? So several different ways that I think we can think about that particular passage. My, my larger point being, this is pretty darn violent. Uh, and I remember the first time that I encountered this text many years ago, I thought, this is pretty darn violent. I mean, this is, um, uh, you know, this is American psycho territory, uh, you know, other sort of uh, late modernist or postmodernist text. This is, you know, Cormac McCarthy's uh, Blood Meridian territory. I mean, this is pretty over the top and it continues to get worse. And then finally, you know, for us to uh, think about identity, I mentioned earlier about naming. What does it mean? Your name is, I think, a part of you. Uh, you are not given, uh, or excuse me, I should say, you, you do not get to choose your name, but your name becomes inextricably linked with your identity. You see yourself as uh, whatever your name is. And if someone were to say to you, you are no longer that person, you are no longer, you no longer have that name, there might be this kind of danger about no longer being the person that you believed yourself to be. So in terms of identity, uh, you know, uh, the, the naming process, uh, a free person versus a slave, what kind of identity uh, does that uh, person have and how does that transform? How do identities transform here? Orinoco's identity transforms from that of a powerful free person in Africa who owns slaves to being a slave. And what is the identity of colonialists? Uh, and this uh, sort of engages a conversation uh, about colonial theory, about what kind of people become colonialists. Uh, there's an argument there that uh, colonialists are not the best people of one's native country because they are willing to go and live in, in different sort of conditions and have their own identities threatened by being immersed in a native culture. I mean, think about that. If a person is English, what are the sorts of things that constitute English identity? Going to certain places, uh, you know, uh, eating certain foods, engaging with a certain kind of group of people. As soon as a colonialist leaves their native country and goes into a colony, those sorts of things that signal identity are no longer there. In a word, one's identity becomes threatened and it becomes a kind of tension or a battle to maintain identity versus having that identity being overthrown. So in terms of identity, it's relation, uh, uh, so thinking about uh, subjectivity uh, in relation to culture and text. Okay, so what I've done for you here, and I do this, I uh, have done this periodically because I think it's a good way uh, for me to explicate or uh, for you to model uh, what I'm looking for when you begin to write your papers here very shortly. I also like to do this. And if I had all the time in the world, I'd be writing all sorts of academic papers on, on all sorts of different literary texts. Uh, but most of the time, I don't get uh, further than uh, an introductory paragraph. But I want to show you uh, how you might be able to approach a text like Orinoco. First of all, in order to write an introductory paragraph, we have to recognize the sorts of things that characterize an introductory paragraph. And, and I like to say, we, we do like to start broad. I would almost say that we like to start conversational. You don't wanna begin a conversation with your mom or your dad or your sister 
your roommate um, or whatnot with the sort of uh, meat and potatoes, the argument of your paper here. You want to start broader. <clears throat> you want to create interest. Uh, something where somebody who, who might not be familiar with Orinoco might say, oh, yeah, that sounds pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, why don't you tell me more? And then you and then you move slowly through the introductory paragraph. It, it becomes more uh, narrow until you get to Orinoco, and then the argument that you're going to be making in your paper. So let me just give you an example here. So the introductory paragraph and a thesis. The last sentence or two should be uh, the thesis statement uh, of the paper. The last sentence or two of the introductory paragraph is where we should see the thesis, um, more than likely. Everyone likes to hear a good story, and often there is that one person who does a lot of gossiping, right? That's sort of conversational. You're like, oh, yeah, that sounds about, uh, you know, like the people I got together the other day. Uh, my friend so-and-so likes to tell a good story. Okay, so tell me more. They speak to everyone and know everyone's business. This person has a unique position because they know a lot about a lot of people and have the ability to gather, tell, retell, or create new information and withhold or disseminate it. The narrator in Afrobenz Orinoco also has a unique position. For the entirety of Orinoco's story, a man, so this is a man's story, Orinoco, is told through a woman's discursive perspective. Was the narrator privy to all of the information to tell a truthful story? Did the narrator desire to tell a truthful story? What information is created, not from the experience she witnessed, but from her own desires to shape narrative? Michel Foucault, in his classic studies of history of sexuality, the birth of the clinic, and madness and civilization, details the discursive power that the doctor figure, or in this case, the witness, has over society. Thus, in Orinoco, the narrator, a woman operating within a patriarchal society, tells not the story of love, desire, and power, and love, desire and power lost or transformed of the titular character Orinoco, but rather demonstrates her, a woman's, if not subtle, but total discursive power over a male-dominated social reality. Okay, so like all things, it uh, needs work. Um, but uh, what, what is it that I'm trying to argue here? That it is important for us to recognize that the woman is an author and that the narrator is an author. And the narrator has an incredible amount of power over the telling of a man's story. And oftentimes, don't we think about uh, in our society today that we need to give voices to women or to minorities or to people that have been oppressed. They need to have a voice and that voice empowers them. I'm suggesting here that the narrator has a lot of power and she can shape and does shape the narrative of a man. Furthermore, I'm arguing, I would be arguing in this paper and I'm using a post-structuralist theory with uh, Michel Foucault that in the 19th century, the doctor was a very powerful figure because both men and women went to the doctor and told the doctor all sorts of very personal things. So the doctor had an incredible amount of power. And in this way, the narrator sort of mirrors that power that Foucault, uh, Foucault discusses um, in the dynamics uh, of the 19th century, okay? Okay, so that is all that I have for you in this uh, general themes and wrap up. Um, I'm hoping that uh, it um, gave you a general overview of the text and gave you some things for us to think about.